And so just so you know, this is going to be kind of a three-part play. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of introduction and context and background. And then Avery will come in to talk a little bit more in detail about cyanobacterial diversity and, and uh, taxonomy. And then Meredith will come in with a little bit more on toxin distributions and so forth in, in uh, California as we know them. Uh, so just to, as a way of introduction, uh, we're going to broaden this just a bit at the beginning. Uh, cyanobacteria are definitely going to be the focus of this talk, and with good reason. Uh, this is a, a, an issue that has now come on full on stage uh, in the state, and, and there are a number of things to, to consider here with respect to distributions and toxins of cyanobacteria. But I wanted to give you just a little bit of background about a few other things, uh, specifically some of the harmful algae that, that are present uh, in our waters as well. So um, with that as an introduction, here's just a brief overview of what the webinar will be about. Uh, we're going to, as I said, do some intro background context. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the types of harmful algae and even a protozoan uh, that we have in cyanobacteria we face in fresh, fresh water and in California in uh, particular. And then I'm going to talk specifically about toxic and noxious algae. These are, I would call them, uh, presently unappreciated threats in California fresh waters. The focus has been and should be really on toxic cyanobacteria, but we do have a number of other issues and things to think about and, and be aware of. Uh, and then, as I said, one uh, tiny bit about uh, uh, pathogenic uh, protists or protozoa which actually are a rare but significant uh, impact in our waters. Uh, then Avery will come on, talk about cyanobacterial diversity and taxonomy, and then Meredith will come on and talk a bit uh, more about California-specific issues having to do with cyanobacteria and their toxins, um, where we have, where we know we now have recurrent blooms taking place, some of the screening and assessments that are being done and field surveys, and then what we're doing as a state uh, in terms of uh, uh, awareness and, and reactivity to these events. Okay, so having said that, just to provide a little context for those of you who might not be familiar, a uh, question that often arises is why do these things, why do cyanobacteria, why do algae produce toxins at all? And of course, you know, it's highly unlikely that they are trying to uh, poison uh, animals and especially fairly complex animals like ourselves. Uh, that go into the water or eat things from the water. Uh, more likely, they're a form of chemical warfare uh, that uh, algae and organisms are, are enacting between themselves. And there are really three broad categories uh, where people have attributed the production of toxins to these organisms. Uh, the first of these is something we call allelopathy. Uh, the easier way of thinking of that is uh, the idea of killing your competitors. Uh, algae in aquatic ecosystems, whether it's in marine systems or freshwater systems, compete with a lot of other algal species. And anything you can do to get a leg up, if you will, on things like major nutrients, such as nitrogen or phosphorus or silica or even trace elements, uh, anything that you can do to keep your competitors from getting those nutrients and making them available to your own population of course, benefits you in an ecological and in an evolutionary sense. So there are a lot of substances that we know that algae produce which have a negative effect on the growth or activities of competing algae or other organisms. And, and these are called allelopathic compounds. Uh, this is something that is well known from the plant literature and plant biology. Uh, we've known for a long time that, for example, the roots of some plants will release materials that will inhibit the growth of roots or other organisms, other plants in their vicinity. Uh, microalgae do this as well. And, and so uh, allelopathy is, is one of the great expectations that we, we uh, think that toxins might be producing in the real world. Uh, another somewhat related to that is razor deterrence. Uh, that is the idea that tasting bad is good if you're an active part of the food chain. We don't typically think of ourselves as being a part of the food chain. Humans don't have too many things preying on us. But uh, if you're a microscopic alga, there are a lot of things out there that can consume you. And while most people don't really think of micro-consumers, those organisms that would eat algae or other small microorganisms, 
as being highly selective in making decisions about what they eat. In fact, they do. Uh, they are very selective. And so if you are an alga that can make itself taste bad by producing toxins or other noxious substances, uh, micro consumers coming along will spit you back out, literally, and eat something else. And in the process, uh, you get a double benefit. You get a benefit of being spared, and you get the benefit of having your competitors consumed. So grazer deterrence is also one of these factors that we think where toxins play an important role. Uh, and then finally, uh, the idea of there are specific trace elements, such as specific metals, that are present in very short supply in many aquatic ecosystems, iron being one of the ones we know of in the ocean, is actually limiting primary production or the production of plant material in vast stretches of the ocean. Uh, these kinds of metals uh, are often very, very uh, difficult to get a hold of. That is, they're at vanishingly small amounts. And some of these toxins may not be so much toxins in the sense of uh, being nasty to other organisms, but they may bind specific items like iron or other metals and make them available only to the species that produces them, thereby, again, gaining competitive advantage over other species. On the flip side, uh, if this, the parentheses says there may be too many or not enough, uh, there are metals such as copper in many of our environments, that there might just be enough that it actually is toxic to some species. So if you can produce an organic compound that will bind up that copper and make it unavailable to yourself or to other organisms, again, you may have a competitive advantage. So from the point of view of the ecology of these harmful or toxic algae, probably one or more of these strategies is at play uh, when they are producing these toxic substances, rather than, for example, just trying to toxify us. Okay, well, we know a lot more about toxins in marine environments, and that is, quite frankly, because, uh, well, we have a lot more funding in the research community for looking at marine toxins. Uh, and in fact, oops, sorry about that. Uh, if you look at the toxins that are present in marine systems, at least in California coastal waters, we have three real big players. Uh, one is this uh, demoic acid, uh, which is a substance that in humans uh, can uh, uh, cause amnesic shellfish poisoning. Uh, this is a substance produced by a number of diatoms, if you're familiar with different phytoplankton groups, but only a very few groups or only a very few species and really within one genus of, of diatoms. Demoic acid is a, a neuroexciter, so it actually uh, gets into your system, it goes to your brain, it goes to your, the synapse connections in your brain, and it causes them to fire uh, randomly and uh, consistently to the point where it actually will burn your nerves out. Uh, the effects on humans are a number of, of uh, everything from gastrointestinal symptoms to rather severe neurological symptoms and even death. And in, in ecosystems, marine ecosystems, it does affect marine and bird mortalities. Those uh, animals that have higher brain function can be affected. Uh, another group produced by another group of organisms, the dinoflagellate, class of compounds called saxitoxins, which are very powerful toxins and, and give rise to what we call paralytic shellfish poisoning uh, in marine systems. Uh, and these are... Uh, effects are very severe, and both demoic acid and saxitoxins are regularly monitored by the California Department of Public Health. Uh, those are our two real big concerns in coastal marine systems, and there is a third one coming online now, also produced by uh, organisms within the dinoflagellate class, uh, okadaic acid being one of the chief ones, and this gives rise in humans to diuretic shellfish poisoning. The, the shellfish poisoning part of these uh, names uh, indicate the, one of the main mechanisms for getting these poisons into our food chain. Shellfish filter these small organisms out of the water, we eat the shellfish, and we get enough of this material in some cases to, to toxify ourselves. So uh, we have been monitoring these coastally and nationally and internationally for quite a few years now, and we know quite a bit about them. Uh, now, if we go from there to freshwater ecosystems, 
uh, we there are a variety of compounds, and they are the the toxins on the left hand column that are outside this red box that are quote unquote our freshwater derived toxins. And and Avery will get into talking about these a little bit more, and then Meredith will get into the distributions of a few of these that we we know something about. But you'll see up here in the the top box here is amylic acid, uh, faxitoxins, or paralytic shellfish poisoning, and diuretic shellfish poisoning. Uh, these are the ones we know commonly from our marine coastal waters, but you'll notice that, that this table indicates presence in estuaries. And, and if you scroll down to the, uh, the areas outside the red box, you'll see that these quote-unquote freshwater toxins are also showing up in a number of estuary areas. So we have a situation which is a kind of a focal point for a research group that Meredith's group, my own group, and, and a number of other collaborators are now really beginning to look at where we are getting uh, an understanding that these estuarine ecosystems are a place where both the marine toxins are coming or are found together with some of these freshwater source toxins, and our estuaries appear to be places where multiple uh, algal and cyanobacterial-based toxins uh, can be found. So there are multiple stressors that are occurring in some of these estuarine waters. And I give you this information just to kind of introduce it as how we've kind of come from our understanding of toxins in marine systems by marine algae, toxins in freshwater systems by freshwater algae and cyanobacteria, and what that now means for uh, looking at these crossover or, um, if you will, uh, you know, kind of mixed effect areas of estuaries. Okay, so before we get to the, the cyanobacteria and freshwaters, let's, let's talk a little bit about uh, freshwater algae. Um, again, for those of you who are not terribly familiar, cyanobacteria, or what people used to call blue-green algae, uh, are not bacteria, oh, excuse me, are not cyanobacteria, excuse me, they, they are not blue-green algae at all. The cyanobacteria are, in fact, much more related in terms of their cellular composition to the bacteria, which is why we now refer to them as cyanobacteria. There are a few truly uh, algal species, that is their eukaryotic algae, uh, to keep in mind when we're looking at freshwater systems. And some of you as lake managers have probably become aware of this in the last several years. Uh, one in particular, this one right here that I'll talk for a second about, Chromecium parvum, or something that is called the golden alga, is becoming a real problem. It has been a problem in the southwest, further to our east, primarily Texas, Oklahoma, but more recently New Mexico, Arizona. This is a small alga. It has these two little flagella that allows it to be mobile. A uh, picture of it uh, right here. You can see these two little flagella. And it causes what you see manifested here through massive blooms. It causes fish kills, has caused them in a number of regions uh, around the southwest. Uh, the organism uh, can grow easily as an alga. It has a chloroplast, uh, and you can see in this little diagram, it gives it its golden color, which gives it its common name. But this organism also produces a number of very powerful toxins that have effects on a whole variety of organisms throughout the food web, from other co-occurring algae and protozoa all the way up to fish. It has a variety of cytotoxic effects. That is, it can kill cells. It affects cell membranes. And in fact, it is while it is an alga, it is also an excellent predator. And this picture, or the, the um, photograph, the photomicrograph that you're seeing here, if I can get it to play, which won't seem to play here. This is a, a, it was a little video that actually showed several of the algae that were surrounding a small uh, organism that it was literally tearing limb from limb. This organism hunts as a, essentially a little pack of wolves. 
uh, where it will attach to the surface of, of a whole variety of organisms, and it will immobilize it through its toxins, and it will eventually uh, tear it to shreds and gain energy from it. So this is an alga that not only competes, but it consumes. It is so effective at doing this that it forms what are termed EDAPs, ecosystem disruptive algal blooms. And by doing that, it, it actually can disrupt everything in the food web structure from the phytoplankton all the way up to fish. And it has led, in many instances now, to a variety of locations in New Mexico, Arizona, Oklahoma, Texas, where the organism has uh, led to the death of all kinds of things, most uh, notably to fish in a variety of, of places. We didn't worry too much about this a few decades ago, uh, but in fact it is press releases where this organism has in the last several years caused problems in freshwater ecosystems in California. So uh, basically this has marched from east to west from Texas uh, over the last two decades, and we now deal with this. And in fact, we have had fish kills in Lake Menifee, in uh, 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 Vision, uh, Mission Viejo, and a few other lakes in the region where the organism has led to the deaths of, of many, many fish, in some cases wiped out entire ecosystems. So sometimes uh, this is going to pop up. Uh, we feel that this is probably uh, only the first of what we will see as an increased number of instances of this organism. Okay, another one. Uh, that is, again, a classic eukaryotic alga, not a cyanobacterial uh, mat or, or organism, but something that has the lovely name of Didymos, uh, Didymosphenia germinata. Uh, it is for the reason uh, that name is so complicated. It is usually called Didymo. And it forms something really lovely called rock snot on, on various uh, freshwater ecosystem surfaces. And here you can see in a stream, uh, I believe this is from the eastern Sierra, uh, it forms this mass of algae, which when you look at it microscopically, are all these little sort of bowling pin shaped cells. Uh, these are very tiny organisms, but they link together in these kinds of stalks that they grow and it ends up forming this large mass of material uh, that actually will cover the bottom and it actually is uh, the resistant to degradation. It has a lot of adverse effects on fish and invertebrate population and it's a highly invasive species. Something again that is just coming online here in California, we've just become aware of this in recent years and it is expected to spread. It has become a real problem in places like New Zealand and there are active programs to try and keep it from migrating into other regions. Okay, finally, um, just to, to touch on other issues that we have here in California, not a, an alga at all, but a protozoan. So this is in essence a simple eukaryotic cell that doesn't photosynthesize. It acts essentially with animal-like uh, nutrition, something called Nigleria fowleri. And I bring this up because although it's quite rare, uh, it does cause human infections. And, and down here is an article from 2008, and unfortunately another one from just recently up in uh, the Mammoth uh, Lakes region, up in Bishop, uh, in the eastern Sierras, where uh, this organism has caused the death of a few people. Uh, the, the organism lives in warm uh, uh, waters, fresh waters, it has a few life stages. You can see here it has one of these little ciliate or flagellated stages. It has an amoeba stage. It also has a, a resting cyst, if you will. When this organism uh, is introduced into the body, usually through a submersion of your head in warm, stagnant, fresh waters, it makes its way down the uh, ocular nerves or up the ocular nerves into your brain, and it begins to eat brain tissue and it causes a meningitis condition that can progress very rapidly and can lead to death in a matter of a few days. So not an organism that we commonly encounter, but something that we are at least aware of and, and uh, need to be cognizant of. Okay, with that as a brief introduction, I'm gonna have Avery step in here now and, and talk about cyanobacterial diversity and taxonomy. Okay, so 
the cyanobacteria are ancient organisms. Um, these these uh, are more than three billion years old, and they occur in most watersheds, uh, encompassing fresh, brackish, and marine environments, but truly to the poles uh, and even deserts. So these have similarities to algae, as uh, Dr. Karen mentioned before. Uh, they perform, perform um, oxygenic photosynthesis, which has contributed to our atmosphere, uh, the oxygen content of our atmosphere as we know it. They're also able to perform a function called nitrogen fixation, where they're able to take atmospheric nitrogen and make it bioavailable to, um, to the environment. And so these organisms can exist as single cells or as in a colonial state, and they can form dense balloons. And these are potentially harmful, uh, known as harmful algal blooms. And that's pretty much uh, our cause for concern for cyanobacteria. So uh, there are more than 90 different cyanotoxins that are described. Common ones that you'll hear today and ones you should be familiar with are uh, microsystems, anatoxins, dolendrous formopsins, and saxotoxins, like paralytic shellfish poison toxins. So these compounds have the uh, propensity to bioaccumulate and magnify in organisms and in different environments and can cause a variety of problems. And so why do we care about cyanotoxins? Well, they have a tremendous human and environmental health significance. They can affect, as I said, people, but also uh, pets, domestic pets, and even wildlife. And so these are an increasingly uh, increasing problem uh, globally. They're said to be expanding in uh, uh, distribution, but and in, in, in increased frequency, but we are un, unsure if uh, the actual increases in the in the um, accounts of these organisms are simply due to heightened awareness or surveillance. But it is true that environmental factors do play a role in the um, in the uh, uh, occurrence of these organisms. And so, one thing that that people have uh, pointed their finger at is climate change. And so, you know, releasing uh, carbon dioxide into the atmosphere is creating a, a situation where temperatures are warming. We're going through a greenhouse warming period. Um, also, uh, linked to the abundance of these organisms are nutrient inputs and a variety of nutrient inputs um, of all different types. And it, another thing that also contributes to the uh, occurrence of these organisms is hydrologic modification, such as building dams and uh, changing water flows. And so, as I mentioned, we have um, some links with climate change with these cyanobacteria. And so, as I mentioned, greenhouse warming is projected to increase temperatures of, of sea surfaces and, and uh, just about any water body globally by the, by the end of the century. And so it's likely that lakes, rivers, streams, and other smaller areas will actually see an increase uh, in increased elevated temperature from the four to five uh, degrees C expectation. So we know that temperature is a fundamental driver of biochemistry and metabolism. And cyanobacteria are known to like things, uh, they like it hot. And so things that accompany warming um, that also promote the abundance of these organisms is stratification. And water column stratification is simply laying down thin layers of the water. Um, the, it, will, it will stop a flow. Basically, it will be a relaxed flow. These organisms can divide and proliferate into a bloom situation, as we mentioned before. So not only does temperature promote the growth of these organisms, but it also can increase their range and increase the time that they are able to bloom during the year, which we call bloom season or a window. So Dave showed this chart earlier, and he mentioned the, the, the main showcase toxins, as we call them here. But there are a variety of other accessory toxins that we have uh, paid less attention to over time as researchers, uh, partly because of the occurrence, but partly because of the significance. And some of these are just becoming uh, known to us. And so the, the toxins in this box here represent things that we can find in estuaries that we thought were either of freshwater or of marine origin. Um, and it turns out the fresh, the, these uh, estuaries are kind of like a depositional place or a collection area for a variety of these 
uh, toxins. These include things like, as I mentioned, microcystin, anatoxin, cylindrous bromopsins, nodularins, cycloimmunes of a variety of, of different classes. There's uh, lingbiotoxins, bromidolides, microgynins, microviridins, and even carlotoxins. And they have a, a variety of different modes of action. And here, in this column here, shows the, this mode of action in mammalian cells. So all of these have an effect on us. So, um, so this is microcystis, um, mostly or probably microcystis originosa being the species. And so this is just a, this is kind of a. Um, a visible manifestation. This is a, a pretty dense bloom of microcystis. Um, has a kind of a paint-like um, appearance on the surface of the water, and it's typically found on the surface and not much under um, if it's alive. And so, if you were to look at this organism in a microscope, you would see something like this. And a microcystis produces these these classic um, what they're called clathrate columns uh, formations. They're just basically just these these interesting. Um, um, conglomerations here. And looking a little bit closer, you see something like this. Now, these cells start to actually have uh, some structure. Uh, when you go a little farther, they look like this, but you still do not recognize the colonies. Now, these organisms can exist as single cells or as the colonial form in the environment. So um, so this is just kind of a, a visible manifestation at a, at a water flow that has stopped. So a relaxation of flow in this dam here, and the cyanobacteria can just, uh, they can explode in situations like this, especially when things like nutrients are present and the temperature is elevated. Now this is a, a nice glass of microcystis here, and I would uh, recommend that nobody drinks anything like this. So these are drinking water concerns. So, you know, we have these problems in Southern California, but what about the rest of the state? Well, this is the Klamath River. This is the Klamath Dam. And this is probably microcystis um, just exploding on the other side of the dam. It's blooming to very high concentrations. You can see that they've, you know, uh, the high water level here basically, you know, leading to a stratified uh, system in the orifice. Take off. Here we see some photos from Pinto Lake. Uh, Pinto Lake is just a, a little bit inland in the central Central Valley, and um, this this lake is one of the hot spots in California. As you can see this this photo here. Um, gets at one time one of the highest levels of microcystin um, or measured at this exact lake here. This lake actually could flow into the ocean, which is another cause for concern. So this is just a, a nice little picture of a, another toxic cyano. This is Anfanazonamon plus aqua. And Anfanazonamon, um, there's a variety of species that belong to the genus. They can produce a variety of toxins, uh, some of the most important ones being the anatoxin and cylindrospermopsin, but also the saxitoxin that Dave mentioned before. And so what you're seeing here are this, this glass or grass clipping um, appearance here. Um, it's actually, you know, if you were to look at it under a microscope, it would look like this. This is a bundle of these individual filaments that have basically come together in the presence of a grazing, um, a little animal called a cladoceran. Uh, it's named Daphnia pulex. It's uh, a water flea. And so, so when these organisms bundle together, they're, you know, inedible to the water flea. And you'll see this kind of manifestation. So just to orient you on some other organisms here. So these cyanobacteria come in all different types of uh, you know, colors, sizes, shapes. So, and they have a variety of different characters to them. So this is anabana. Um, you can see some of the, these are actually these resting little spores that are able to come off and start a new colony. Um, they have heterocysts where they're able to do the process of nitrogen fixation, as I mentioned before. Um, this is another. This is nodularia here. Also has these these nice heterocysts associated. This is cylindrical.
cylindra spermum. It also has these nice heterocysts, but these ones are terminal. If you notice, these ones are actually on the outsides of the uh, filaments as opposed to inside where we're seeing them in Anabena. And moving on, we have uh, Lingbia, which is another toxic cyano. This is a filamentous form. Um, it has this, this uh, characteristic sheet morphology, sheet structure on the outside, which is taxonomically important. And here we have another uh, filament oscillatoria, um, which is uh, very prevalent in our systems. And so if you want to classify these organisms, uh, we're realizing that you have to take sort of a hybrid approach. So um, you have to take a combinatorial approach. And so taxonomy is kind of our you know, it's science, it's our way of, of putting things into little categories so we can make sense of them. And so this conventional by design, it's traditional, but it's necessary for our orientation in the natural system. We have to start somewhere, these guys. And so this is problematic with cyanobacteria because, as I just showed you in the previous slide, a lot of these organisms, you know, although they do have some different characters, they look very similar. And when you have a mixture of them, Together, um, things start getting um, a little uh, confounding. So it's difficult to ID uh, these organisms at the species level, and this is because of the pronounced uh, cryptic diversity in these organisms. Um, so the taxonomy is traditionally based on morphology being a shape, uh, a shape recognition, and you would do this with a microscope. So you take a water sample and you put it under the microscope. Um, and all the variable characters that I mentioned that the cyanobacteria are confounding. And these include, you know, things like cell size, filament width, uh, the calling morphology, and even maybe a fixative that you uh, put these organisms in. And, and you may view them live as well, so they have a lot of different manifestations. So, so the hybrid approach for the classification moved beyond the microscope. So this also includes molecular methods. So looking at, at DNA, for instance, this DNA barcoding strategy, using a short piece of genetic information uh, to bin these guys and put them into a group. And so using things like this, these molecular methods, we actually, we're actually able to differentiate between toxic and non-toxic organisms or populations of some organisms because some of them are able to make toxins in different locations, and they may be the identical organism and uh, be non-toxic in another. So the molecular uh, component also allows us to be very accurate in identification because, as the old saying is, genes don't lie. Um, less subjective microscopic evaluation. The problem is that there is a lag to uh, the monitoring application of these advanced methods. Now, every monitoring um, facility does not have the capability of performing PCR, qPCR, and other molecular, um, uh, sophisticated molecular um, techniques, as well as the equipment that they use. Um, so this stuff is just coming online. But researchers have, have been at this for a while, and so the information is out there, and it's, it's available. So we're, you know, we're slowly getting to the point where we can start using these molecular methods. So, you know, finally, weaving these together um, is going to be necessary uh, moving forward to properly delineate species of these organisms because, because they're very cryptically diverse. And so uh, there's an argument that even using some physiological traits may be um, important in determining who's, who's who and who's where because ultimately what we want to know is what is in our water. So just a few more organisms um, just to kind of go over here. So this is Anabena. Anabena is... Uh, it's basically a benthic or a substrate-loving form um, of another organism, uh, recently termed Dolichospermum. They used to all be called Anabena. And Dolichospermum would be the planktonic form that lives in the water column. So Anabena is able to fix nitrogen. It has, all, has a variety of these little heterocysts that are here. Um, if you look closely, you can see them. And Anabena is important because it produces anatoxin A, the cylindrospermopsin, and even paralytic shellfish poisoning toxins. Over on this panel is another organism, Pseudoanabena. 
And pseudanabana is um, it's a toxic organism, but in our system in Southern California, nobody has uh, actually evaluated this organism to our knowledge. And so uh, we have some information to glean from this species. It's very common. So here we have Cylindrus promopsis. It's probably one of the most uh, problematic or what we what we would feel the most problematic species um, you know, in freshwater and in estuarian systems in Southern California. The cylindrus bromopsis pumps out cylindrus bromopsin as a toxin, and it can make a variety of other things, such as anatoxin and the paralytic shellfish poison toxins. And so uh, cylindrus bromopsis can come in a variety of different shapes. It has these, these straight chain filaments here, as well as these curved and even uh, sometimes even spiral formations and it can have it can it can have a heterocyst where it can fix the nitrogen or it can not and so um, depending on your expertise you would be calling this a different organism so cylindrospermum is another another uh, toxic organism system here uh, this will make anatoxin a and maybe even cylindrospermopsin depending on where you find it and it has these nice terminal heterocysts that are easily um, recognizable Oscillatoria. This is actually uh, a little photo micrograph showing three different kinds of oscillatoria from a, a community photo. Um, three different species, definitely. And here's another just showing uh, kind of a stacked coin, as we call it, morphology of these organisms. Now, oscillatoria can make it can make anatoxin A, and it can make microcystin, and we found both of those in uh, isolates from Southern California. And so the presence of you know multiple organisms in a community like this is kind of indicative of a complex community. And um, in this situation, there could be you know a variety of toxins even being produced by the same genus of organisms. So uh, here we have. Uh, uh, so if you if you got you no know, blue green algal supplements, you'll see these. You'll see something, or you've heard of spirulina. Well, spirulina is a pretty uh, innocuous species. Um, but here we have it co-occurring with, with formidium. And formidium can make saxitoxin, and it can actually make a variety of other toxins, like formidoline. And so here you see a co-occurrence, and this is a natural community picture. You see the co-occurrence of the spirulina and the formidium in the same water sample. So you probably wouldn't want to be obtaining the blue green algal supplement sample here. And here is just, this is a picture of an unknown branched filament um, that we are very interested in. We have not much, uh, we don't have an idea what it is yet, and there are a variety of these things that exist. And so the point of all of this is just to know, you know, who's in our water because we feel that it's very important to know these things. Okay, and uh, Meredith, now I think we'll switch over to you and um, you can let me know. I can advance slides for you. Okay. Yeah, that'd be great. So um, we're going to switch gears a little bit, and I'm really going to more focus on some of the toxins that we've been detecting and talk about what the state's doing to kind of deal with um, some of the freshwater have issues that we have. So you can go to the next slide. Um, so. When you look at the state as a whole, you know, there's been a lot of webinars in the last couple of years, and you've probably heard about some of the most um, well-documented areas, which are mostly in central and northern California, where we have recurrent blooms. So the Klamath is one that's a big one. It's actually listed as impaired based on microcystin toxin concentrations. Clear Lake is another one. Um, the San Francisco Bay Area and the Delta, Another area where you've got multiple different types of toxin stressors in those regions. Um, another big one that you've probably heard a lot about is Pinto Lake and the Monterey Bay area. Um, Pinto Lake actually now has a remediation strategy and implementation plan in place because um, it, it has so many recurring blooms constantly over many years now. Um, and so when you look at this map, you really notice there's a lot that we know about central and northern California, and there's, you know, almost very little to nothing 
that we that we really know about Southern California. And so that's kind of where Dave and Avery and I have come in and kind of said, well, there's not a lot of data down here. And so it's not that we have data that's showing we don't have toxin. It's that there's really very little data compared to the northern part of the state. And so what I'm going to do is really just kind of um, show you a, a little snippet of, of some of the work we've been doing in Southern California. So next slide, Dave. Um, and so uh, this is a map of microcystins. Every site that we've tested microcystins in from about 2011 to 2014. Um, and what you can see is that you really see it kind of all over Southern California. It's been detected in any, every kind of water body that we've tested, so depressional wetlands, coastal lagoons, lakes, streams, rivers, estuaries. We've detected it in different fractions of the water column, so whether you're looking in the plankton or inside these cells, whether you're looking at the dissolved fraction, which is kind of external to the cells, or whether you're looking at benthic or pelagic, um, you know, we're really seeing it in, in kind of every matrix possible, and we're seeing it across many land use types. And so what I'll do now is I'll just show you a few highlights from, from, from some of the studies that have gone into this map. Uh, next slide. Um, so we started out doing some screening level assessments, and really what that means is that um, we have a lot of, especially SCORP, has a lot of assessments and field programs going on that are not necessarily focused on HABs or HAB toxins, but I basically kind of went around and said to people, out of the goodness of your heart, would you consider collecting an extra sample that I could run for toxins? And so most of what you saw on that map, majority of it, uh, are, are samples that were just collected that way, where there was already a field program going on, it had nothing to do with toxins, but people were very generous and very interested in this topic, and so we're very willing to supply samples, and then we just had to kind of pull together some funding to, to do the analysis. And so I'm going to talk uh, today about a couple of probabilistic studies, uh, weightable streams, um, and depressional wetlands. And then I'm going to talk about a couple of targeted studies that are mostly down in the San Diego region um, where we really started to try and do something that was more monitoring based and less assessment based. So next slide. Um, so one of the, the main reasons we really started to look at cyanotoxins in streams or, and just really down in Southern California in general is because there is a large regional monitoring program for weightable streams in the state of California, um, and there's many groups that are involved in this. And as part of this, while they're not necessarily looking at toxins per se, they were looking at the taxonomy of which organisms are growing in these streams. And so what we did, we, we started pulling some of that data together, and we started um, characterizing it as either potentially toxic taxa at the genus level, which are all those yellow squares that you see, potentially toxic taxa at the species level, uh, which are the, the red uh, diamonds, and then samples where there was just no toxic taxa at all um, are in the blue triangles. And so the left panel is, when we looked at this for any kind of cyanotoxin, and then the right-hand panel was when we just looked at microcystin organisms. And so what you see is 90% of stream kilometers support some kind of toxic genre of cyanotoxins, and 23% support um, some kind of toxic species. And so when you look at that, you really think, gee, we should be looking for toxin because we're highly likely to find it especially microcystins, because when you look at the right-hand panel, there's quite a lot of, of microcystin-producing taxa that are potentially producing toxin here. So next slide. So what we started to do was this was a great example of where there's a statewide regional monitoring program, and we asked people to collect toxin samples for us, and we got a huge response. Um, so you can see the little inset is the whole state, and there's some um, you know, pretty high values up in the Sierras. There's a few that we got in the Bay Area, and then we actually had a lot more samples in Southern California, so there's a blow-up of the Southern California site, so you can just see it. But basically what this is is it's benthic algae, so that means it's algae that are kind of growing on some kind of substrate, usually a rock, um, and 
and they are actually producing toxins. And so what this means is that you basically have streams as a source of toxin loading to water bodies that are farther downstream, like the estuaries and the reservoirs and the lakes. Um, the other thing to note about this study is that we did, at a subset of sites, we did try and do more than just microcystins because we were seeing the taxa that could potentially produce other types of toxins. So we did try and do a little bit, and we, we actually did detect lingviotoxin, anatoxin A, and saxitoxin at some sites. Um, so next slide. Um, so this was another probabilistic uh, condition assessment uh, on depressional wetlands. And so this was one where they did not include toxins initially, but they were willing to collect field samples for us. And this is kind of a one-time condition assessment where they went out on one random day in the spring of 2012, and they collected what we call a grab sample, which just basically means you collect a water sample on one day while you're standing in front of your water body. And so even just with grab samples, what you're seeing is that almost 50% of the sites were positive for microcystins, and about 5% were positive for saxitoxin. Um, next slide. So what we started to do at this point is, you know, we were seeing a lot of toxic taxa, we were seeing a lot of toxins, and so we really said, you know, we need to move out of an assessment stage and more into uh, a monitoring stage. And so the problem is that sometimes when you go out and you collect these grab samples, they're not necessarily representative of whether or not the water body is toxic over the long term. And so what we wanted to do was incorporate this newly developed monitoring tool, which is a passive sampler that we call SPAT. And it's really useful because it's very cheap um, and it's time integrative. So you basically just, you can see it's about the size of a tea bag, and you just use a zip tie and you tie it onto something in your water body and it provides a continuous toxin detection. And that really captures a lot of um, toxin events that, you know, when you go out just on one random day, you may miss that, and then next, the next week there might be toxin production happening in your water body, and so you'd, you'd miss it with a grab sample. And so this is really, really useful uh, for monitoring and screening. The downside is when you get your toxin concentrations back, you really can't distinguish between whether or not there was just a, a low concentration of toxin over the entire time frame or whether there was a pulse of really high toxin that came into your water body. Uh, next slide. So what we did was we started to use these and really compare them to grab samples. So these are two maps of the San Diego region, and this was a lakes and estuaries and reservoir study. We went to about 20 sites a few times. Um, back in 2013. And so the left-hand panel is showing you the grab sample results. And what you'll see is that there's a lot of white circles, which indicates that basically we didn't detect any toxin at those sites. And when you look at the right-hand panel, which are the SPAT sample results, every single site was toxic. And so what this really shows you is that those grab samples are, are missing toxins. And we found the same results. We went back to the depressional wetlands sites from that depressional wetlands survey that I showed you before. We went back to the same sites in San Diego a couple of times. And, and when we looked at that, those um, results, the grab samples, about 29% of the sites, according to the grab samples, were toxic. But the SPAT samples showed us that 83% of our sites were toxic. So that's a pretty big difference. Uh, next slide. And so quickly, because I know we only have a few more minutes, I'm going to just talk very quickly about you know, what the state is doing uh, about freshwater HABs. And there's a number of, of, of things that are in place, and then there's a, a number of things that are kind of in the works and being developed right now. Um, most of you have hopefully heard about CC Habs, which is our cyanobacteria harmful algal bloom network. Um, we have some health advisory thresholds in the state. We have a uh, freshwater hab strategy that's still being developed, but I expect to be released in about the October timeframe out to the public. And then I want to talk really quickly about what the SWAP program is doing. So next slide. Um, so the CC Habs network is basically um, just a network of all stakeholders that are interested or affected by Habs. Um, there is an email listserv. If you'd like to be added to it, please email me. And I do have the, the website. This is now um, 
They are a um, part of the portal of the you know, California Water Quality Monitoring Council, so you can find their website there. Um, next slide. Um, so we also in this state have health advisory thresholds. And um, what you see here is that for recreational use, the, the left-hand side here that says California Recreational Action Thresholds, those are our thresholds in California for recreational purposes. Um, we don't have drinking water thresholds, but EPA just recently, a couple months ago, came, in, came out with some drinking water thresholds. Um, and if you go to the next slide, you know, a lot of this has come out, or the drinking water thresholds have come out of the Toledo water crisis. And some of you may have heard about that. That made national headlines last summer. And while there was a lot of things in place in our state, like the thresholds and the, and the network, when this happened last summer, it really got a lot of uh, state and local agencies talking, are we prepared for something like this? You know, they basically shut down the drinking water for about two days, and that affected a lot of people. And I know that the media reported a lot of things like you can't bathe in it, you can't drink it. But even when you talk to some of the people that were involved in this process, it went way beyond that. They had to shut down some hospital operating rooms because they couldn't sanitize their, their, um, their instruments and their, their equipment. You know, the dialysis centers had to put everything on hold. Um, so it really impacted a lot of different areas besides just being able to bathe in your tap water. Um, so this really got people talking in our state. And so as a result, there's been a lot that's been developed in the last year and a lot that's been planned for the next couple of years. So next slide. Um, so one of the main, uh, so two, two things have come out. One is we are developing a statewide freshwater hab strategy. And what this basically is is just a long-term vision um, of what kind of infrastructure we need and what we need to put in place that we don't have in order to have a statewide monitoring program and in order to be able to respond when we have these HAB events happen. And so this is something that we'll, we'll likely send out publicly probably in October. Right now the advisory committees are still reviewing it and making some tweaks to it. Um, but basically it calls for you know, a centralized website, a reporting system, Guidance, you know, what happens if you're a water body manager, what do you do if you notice that there's a bloom going on in your area? And if we want to have a statewide uh, monitoring program, we need to have consistent collection and analysis protocols so that everyone's doing everything the same way so that we can collate all the data at the end of the day. And so um, a lot of this is being developed through the Swamp Freshwater Habs program. They're supplying a lot of the resources that we need to put the infrastructure in place. Some of that will be done next year, some of it probably in 2017. They've already conducted some training webinar, training sessions, sorry, not webinars, training sessions this year, and they have more planned for next year. Um, they're also planning to use some remote sensing, and they've been working with NOAA to detect blooms, as well as to identify remotely which blooms are actually comprised of cyanobacteria. And then ultimately, they really want to initiate a statewide monitoring program. So all of this is being used to that end. Um, and I think that's it. Dave, I think you can go to the last slide, which is our acknowledgments. And you know, there's actually a lot of people that have been involved in what we just presented. Um, so we've put kind of the main ones here. And I think with that, we'll take any questions. Hi, this is Susan Paul Yukonis with the California Environmental Health Tracking Program. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. I was on mute before. Apologies. Um, great presentations. Um, thank you so much. This is so much useful information. Um, we are interested in the tracking program, in um, getting involved with tracking uh, the health outcomes and, and health implications of um, these blooms in California and uh, are just beginning to learn lots and lots. So I, I just uh, posted this question on the chat, but I'll go ahead and ask it. Earlier in the day, I um, sat through a demo of the CDC's new HABS data collection system that is just about to go um, into pilot phase with a number of states. And then I believe will be the plan is for it to go online in the spring. And it's pretty extensive. And I wondered. Um, if any of the speakers were familiar with that system 
and whether that might be uh, a good starting point for data collection, at least in terms of health implications for the state. Uh, I, this is Dave Karen. I'm not familiar with that myself. Uh, Meredith, do you have any familiarity with it? Yeah, I'm, you know, I'm not familiar with it, um, and I'm not sure which states are doing it. I think some, you know, I'll say this, in, in writing the, the HAB strategy, one of the first things that I did was I contacted a lot of states that have monitoring programs and talked to their, their program leads. And so there are a number of states that are, are a little bit ahead of us as far as they have a routine monitoring program. They've had one in place for several years, so they have quite a bit of data. So I suspect that those are the states that the CDC is probably utilizing for the pilot part of it. Um, so I'm not totally familiar with exactly what it is, but, um, but that would okay. be great because I think that's definitely one of the things that's lacking and that um, we're not necessarily always tracking these things. I, I was actually going to uh, follow up with them because there's a lot of interest in the Department of Public Health in trying to do some kind of data collection around this. Um, and we'd been talking about trying to start developing a system, but this thing that they've created, at least from the demo today, looks looks very comprehensive. Um, so I was going to contact them and see if there was any way California could get involved with the, the pilot um, because there's so much going on in the state right now. So um, I'm, I'd uh, love to include you guys in on that conversation as well. Yeah, I would love it if you would email me. That would be fantastic. Okay, thanks. Okay, we have two questions that were sent in via the chat. Uh, first is, there's no mention of dermal effects from toxins. Are they of concern? Uh, well, yeah. yes. I mean, the, the short answer is yes, uh, but this is one of, I guess, relative magnitude. Uh, certainly, uh, drinking water quality is probably the primary consideration and, and then uh, you know, extrapolation from that to domestic animals. Uh, but certainly there are irritants that a number of these uh, organisms can cause. So a dermatitis is, is not uh, unusual or inconsequential. But uh, next to the, some of the hepatotoxin activities of some of these compounds, it's probably not quite at the, the same level. Okay, the next question uh, has to do with eradication. What are the best methods for eradication. If the bloom dries out, will it reoccur once it is rehydrated? It's a good question. Um, you know, certainly the um, rehydration of a dried bloom, um, it, it depends on whether the organism is, is capable of forming a resistant resting stage or a cyst, uh, which is not uncommon with these organisms. Uh, rehydration uh, doesn't necessarily address sort of the fundamental question, which are the nutrient budgets. You know, the, the best way to deal with these things is proactively, that is, to understand your water supply or your water system, understand the sources, the major sources of nutrients coming in. The same things that grow plant material in general, uh, the nu basic nutrients, nitrate, phosphate, ammonia, those things contribute to the growth of, of cyanobacterial and algal blooms in aquatic systems. So understanding those, those inputs and, and trying to control them is probably the best way of trying to, to address the issue in the first place. Yeah, and I'll just add that, you know, this is a question that has come up quite a lot recently. And so um, SWAMP is actually going to fund a, a one-day workshop next year to talk about, to discuss, you know, remediation and mitigation strategies, uh, specifically for lakes, but it would probably be applicable to several water bodies. And so um, that's coming down the pike. So once we have a date for that and an announcement, I can certainly send that to Eric so he can send it out to this listserv. Yeah, and if I could just reiterate, you know, being proactive in terms of lake management is by far uh, I would think most scientists would agree the best strategy. That is, there are things you can do after the fact. Uh, there are some pretty toxic materials you can put in your lakes. There are uh, some things that will bind up phosphorus, for example. There are some things that will kill outright copper sulfate. These are things that once you get into these, you're, you're fighting an uphill battle in the sense that 
uh, the nutrients are not going to be removed uh, effectively, at least not long term, by many of these approaches. And, and you're adding a, a toxicity in the, in the way that you deal with them. By far, the best way is to deal with the, the nutrient budget to begin with. That is to make sure that your system is not eutrophying, to make sure that uh, you have a management strategy that is going to allow water turnover or nutrient removal or prevention of nutrients that will uh, stop these blooms. Okay, we've had a couple more questions sent in via chat. Uh, is anyone conducting any DNA analysis to track toxin-producing strains of particular cyanobacteria genus and species? Eric, we are just starting to do that. Uh, next question is, any correlation between high fecal coliform counts in surface waters, potentially from grazing, and toxins? Absolutely not. Uh, only in the sense that where there are fecal coliforms coming in, there is undoubtedly going to be nutrients coming in. So, uh, you know, this is a matter of uh, not a direct link, if you will, but the source of one uh, leads to is the source of the other. There's a temperature about water temperature that cyanos prefer, and usually it's like a 20 degree threshold, but that doesn't, you know, below that does not exclude cyanos. They will live from, you know, four degrees. They'll live in the refrigerator, but they won't bloom or proliferate until the, the temperature goes up quite a bit, which is why you typically only see them um, in, you know, the early summer through the, you know, kind of late fall in Southern California. And then things kind of cool off a little bit because the ambient temperature is just a little bit lower. But they're always present. And it, that also depends on what, what genus and, you know, what class you're also looking at in cyanus. So. And it's worth noting that you can have a, a switch, if that, uh, to use that phrase, meaning uh, you may have a seasonal uh, abundance of cyanobacteria in the summer, and you may have a seasonal high of other algae, eukaryotic algae, during the other months. Thank you. Uh, another question came in. Is there any correlation with HABs and quagga or zebra mussels? <laughs> Maybe an inverse one. Uh, Quaggas and yeah. zebra, zebra mussels are very effective at removing algae from the water. And typically, uh, if you can consider it a benefit, one of the benefits of a quagga or a zebra mussel outbreak is that water clarity tends to go up as the water tends to become clearer as a consequence. Uh, please reconfirm uh, there needs to be a bloom to have toxins. A really good question, and the answer to that is no. Uh, you know, we're very familiar with this from marine systems where you can have an algal bloom and it is perfectly fine. There's nothing toxic about it. And then you can have situations where there's very little color in the water, and in fact it's quite a toxic situation. The problem is that these compounds, some of them, are toxic at such uh, very low concentrations that a huge buildup in biomass is not necessary. However, of course, if you have a very substantial buildup of a toxic alga, then you have the potential for very, very high concentrations of toxin as well. So while a, a bloom of a toxic alga is, is not uh, uh, you know, indicates that you probably do have toxin there. The, the lack of a massive bloom does not necessarily indicate that. There's also the issue of transport, uh, at least in things like freshwater streams and in the example we gave from sort of the lagoon and estuary uh, ecosystems that we've looked at. Uh, we feel that many of those toxins are, are not present there because they're produced there, but they're transported in. So whereas the bloom might be quite far upstream, then you actually still have a toxic situation pretty far downstream where you have no visible manifestation of the bloom. Does aeration help reduce algae? It can. It certainly yeah. can. Okay. But, uh, but, if you're, but if your aeration is only in the water column, you still be, be uh, allowing for the growth of the benthic mat, mat uh, producing species. Okay. Uh, should we be testing for cylindrospermopsin in California now that EPA has given guidelines on that toxin? Absolutely. That should be a major focal point. 
Okay. Uh, this is a question probably for all three of you. Is there a current list of labs that are capable of processing cyanobacteria samples? You know, I hmm. think Swamp was working on collating a list. So I don't actually have it, but I can ask around if that list is collated yet. They're, they're, they were working on it. It will probably be finalized in 2016. But I think that that is a critical piece that, you know, I, I get asked that all the time. Where do we send samples if we think we have a problem? The thing to consider here is that um, it depends on what information you hope to glean from those samples. Uh, you know, we, we in science are not regulatory agencies. So if you're going to go that route or you need that sort of information, you need to go with a group that, that has uh, the samples are collected correctly for regulatory purposes. However, having said that, there are lots of laboratories like my own which are very interested in obtaining samples, trying to document whether or not toxins are present, trying to identify and culture the species that are the causative agents of those toxins. And that is helping to build a resource within the state so that we can begin to identify issues and, and try to uh, link them to specific organisms and maybe management strategies. So uh, we, for example, in my own lab, we're happy to receive samples and we can, we can and often do give managers a heads up for what the issues they are looking at might be and then they can pursue whatever avenues they want to. How far in distance from a source has an algal toxin been detected? Hmm. That's a good question. Like. Uh, I'm not sure. I think Pinto Lake was a good example where the toxin, that was the toxin source, and they were detecting toxin in Monterey Bay, and it was causing the mortality of endangered sea otters because the sea otters were eating um, the shellfish that were infected. I'm not sure the exact mileage on that. I'd have to look that up. Um, but that's the, the yeah, most the blatant one. one I can think of right now. Yeah, the simple fact is, Eric, it is such a new concept that you can have toxins produced in a freshwater environment and then far downstream you may have their effects still being felt. It's such a new idea that there really is not much of a database yet. But that is something yeah. you're trying to do. This is Sue. Can I jump in? Sure. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to let folks know that um, Klamath River t annually has um, transport of cyanobacteria from the dams that are at River Mile 189 down to the estuary. We've been seeing that every summer for the last several years. So that's a good mileage indicator. And also somebody had asked about genetic studies. Um, Tim Otten and Theo Dreyer with OSU, Oregon State University, have done genetic studies on cyanobacteria and given presentations at the Klamath Basin Monitoring Program webpage. Uh, monitoring program meetings, which are available on the KBUMP webpage if people are interested. Thank yeah, you. We also have a video available that uh, Theo Dreyer gave several years ago to the Collaboration Network. So it's, it's on our YouTube site. Really good. So we have a request to show the slide containing the, the content or contact information for the CC Hab workgroup. And we have a message that came in that uh, there's a website with six labs in California that are processing uh, blue-green algae enumeration or toxin analysis or both there. And there's also SANO testing information available on the EPA webpage. If anyone wants to, to contest contact us directly uh, with you know the idea of sending samples or getting more information, please feel free. 